<laughs> All right. Thank Let you. Let me click a little something there. Okay, thank, uh, thank you, Martha, and uh, glad to see everybody online. It's a great uh, occasion. And uh, just, uh, oh, I also would like to thank the <coughs> Rail Committee um, Research and the Intellectual Life Committee in the department. Um, so my thanks to, those who, to the uh, dear colleagues on the committee and especially to, again, to Martha for helping uh, uh, me and uh, Zach to make this event uh, 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 possible. So I'm very happy to uh, to have this opportunity to say a few words you know, to to introduce uh, Zach and uh, just a little backstory. You know, it's a uh, we when Zach and I were uh, were talking about this visit, uh, our hope was to be able to bring Zach back on campus in the building in person. But uh, thanks. But no thanks to the pandemic, you know, it didn't work out. But so we will have to uh, settle with uh, uh, doing this event uh, uh, remotely, but of course with uh, equal uh, uh, pl pleasure. <laughs> and as, as, as many of you uh, know that uh, Zach graduated uh, from the department in 2016, right? And uh, for the year 2016 to 2017, uh, Zach stayed uh, in the area and worked as a, a postdoctoral research fellow at the uh, National Center for Digital Government. Meanwhile, uh, also working with the Wiki uh, Education Foundation as a research fellow. I should add with it, uh, Zach uh, had been working uh, for quite a, for more than a few years, right? Almost throughout the, uh, his graduate study. So uh, as you can see, uh, Zach has a really, really extensive uh, experiences working with the uh, Wiki Foundation, you know, and everything behind and uh, uh, around it. So uh, to uh, look forward a little bit, you know, so his presentation today uh, uh, will be uh, of great interest uh, to me and many of, uh, of us. Um, Zach's interest, uh, research interests uh, ranges from uh, media uh, history and media technology to uh, continental critical theory. And uh, his scholarship you know, in all those areas is uh, more, than, uh, more than solid. It is not uh, my habit to praise uh, people that I know very well, I worked with and know very well in the, uh, here and now. Uh, so uh, uh, let me say that. Uh, uh, it has been a pleasure uh, for me to have known him, you know, and we keep working together all these years. And uh, I might add um, shamelessly that uh, Zach has been a, a fearless leader, uh, e uh, editor for this uh, uh, <coughs> journal uh, coming out of the department and uh, UMass Library uh, Communication Plus One. And, uh, and here, uh, thanks to uh, Marilyn, you know, she has been instrumental from the very beginning in bringing uh, this originally, uh, to me, quite a pretentious uh, project into fruition. So uh, thanks to, uh, to all those uh, uh, con uh, uh, concerned. Um, I, I, I shouldn't be very, uh, very, very long, you know, and uh, it is a pleasure to see, uh, as I said, uh, Zach has been working with the Wiki Education Foundation for, for uh, quite a few years. And so it was a great, uh, a great uh, achievement uh, on his part that uh, his book, on um, the Wikipedia, Wikipedia, was published uh, uh, last year. Right? So uh, I look forward to uh, I and many others look forward to his presentation today. So here, without further ado, I uh, I will pivot and uh, turn the the screen and the microphone to uh, Zach, and uh, join me in welcoming Zach. Uh, coming back to to campus. Here we go, uh, Professor McDowell. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, it's nice to be virtually there uh, and see such wonderful faces. Uh, and I have such uh, amazing, wonderful memories uh, there. And like like Brinkle said, I I continue a lot of the same work that I've been doing uh, from UMass that was supported and inspired by people that I met at UMass. And you know, you all continue to be uh, an inspiration to me. Um, as a, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, as let's move the people in the middle so I can 
stare at things. Uh, as Brankel said, uh, um, actually, you know, to, to begin with, uh, Brankel had mentioned the communication plus one, which, you know, we started, it is now 10 years old. We've had 100,000 downloads. Uh, and we're, uh, we are a very, pretty well established at this point, uh, open access journal. Uh, we don't charge anybody for anything. Um, it's been a labor of love for a long time. And luckily now I have some interested grad students that can help me as well. Uh, so it's not just me um, uh, doing everything um, while, while like asking Brianco for advice. Uh, so now there's, it's, it's been passed on. There's a little bit more labor ha uh, being spread around, which is nice. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so this, uh, this book I, I co-authored with a, a friend of mine, a, a, a good friend and a collaborator, uh, uh, Professor uh, Matthew Vetter. He's at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Um, Matt brings a really interesting perspective to a lot of this because uh, he comes from, he teaches in a PhD program that does, um, uh, it's a comp rep program. So he's teaching people who teach writing. Right. And a lot of the way in which I got into this was by uh, uh, by teaching writing and uh, specifically it was the uh, it was the uh, I'm sure you still do something like this. I don't know if it's still called like communication uh, writing as communication. It's the there are a couple of courses that. You know, when you're a grad student, you get assigned to teach a certain courses, you either teach public speaking or writing as communication. And the first time I taught, I said, uh, students hate this. And uh, when students hate it, uh, they don't learn. And uh, what can I do about this? And so I discovered there was a pilot project with utilizing Wikipedia. And I went to uh, 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 Professor Jen Carella, who was, who was running uh, that. And at the time I said, can I do something weird? And he said, yes, what is it? <laughs> and uh, luckily they trusted me enough and it, uh, it turned out really well. And the pilot project at Wikimedia Foundation ended up turning into a separate nonprofit foundation called the Wiki Education Foundation, to which I you know, still teach with, I still have been using, but you know, through those years and through all these experiences, uh, it really got to, uh, and this is, I've been teaching with Wikipedia now for a decade, and through those experiences, I've learned a lot, and then ended up pivoting that into a, uh, into a, a postdoctoral research uh, project, which, you know, got a couple of publications out of, and through that, I ended up meeting Matt, and we over the pandemic, um, we're just stuck inside, and we're like, well, you know, uh, what are we going to do? And said, well, I don't know. I've always been wanting, like, we've been talking about this stuff for a long time. Why don't we just write a book? And um, so I put a proposal together and we started just kind of like meeting uh, a couple times a week. And, you know, it, it not only was really productive, but I think it also saved my sanity because uh, I had some stuff to do. And um, it was really great. Uh, so this, this really comes out of that. And I'm going to cover... A variety of topics. I'm going to cover, you know, like the 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 name of the the talk, Wikipedia and the representation of reality, which is the name of the book, and then equity, access, and experiment, experiential epistemology. So I'm going to cover these topics, but what I'm going to kind of try to do is give you a little bit of an overview of the book. Um, the problem with this is I've explained to a lot of people uh, whenever I give a talk about Wikipedia is you kind of have to start from the beginning, um, and you know, you all know kind of what Wikipedia is. You've all used Wikipedia. I don't even have to ask that question anymore. Um, I'm not even going to try to go into a lot of the information literacy stuff and whatever, or else I will be here for three hours. Um, I have many, many publications on this at this point. Uh, so, and a bunch of podcasts and a lot of different kind of things. So um, if you want to uh, check into them also, please let's chat about this. I love to talk to people about Wikipedia. I'm still not tired of it. Uh, it is my favorite thing to be both a curmudgeon about as well as also, you know, celebrate. So the, the, the reason why we wrote this book is we realized over all these years of doing all this research and giving talks to other academics and everything else is that no one really knows how Wikipedia works, who isn't a Wikipedian. And even some Wikipedians are confused at some of the levels at which it functions. Um, but 
really what it's about uh, deep, like once you start to get into it is more than just the rules and the policies. Once you start to look at that, you can analyze that and say, what, what is really going on here? Like, what is the disconnect between what Wikipedia says it's supposed to be, the formalized systems, and how does it actually function? What are the unspoken norms? So, you know, we kind of, uh, you know, approach this kind of from a, like an archeological perspective, right? Like very much Foucauldian kind of like, what are these hidden things? And you can see the hidden things through what the outcomes are. You can see the hidden things through the ways the, the conversations happen in the back channels. You can see the hidden things through the ways that policies are, are uh, shaped in one way, but then in, uh, enacted in other ways, right? So once you start to kind of dig into this, you can really start to understand and unpack how Wikipedia functions. And the reason for this, and the reason why it's so important is, you know, one, it's the largest uh, body of knowledge to ever be collected in the history of all, you know, recorded history, uh, you know, greater than the, you know, Library of Alexandria, right? And it, it has this amazing lofty goal to uh, provide free access to the sum of all human knowledge. But the problem with that, especially when you look at just like the basics of Wikipedia is uh, who's editing, right? And uh, how it's being represented and what's included, right? So whose knowledge, who has access to participate? And these are real important questions of access and equity when it comes to providing everyone, right? Not like someone, right? Not, not uh, you know, just these people, uh, access to the sum of all human knowledge, not part of human knowledge, but all of human knowledge, right? And uh, so a lot of these kind of questions come up, not from the basics, which is the Wikipedia you know is probably the English Wikipedia, which is by far the most robust uh, Wikipedia uh, and outweighs all other Wikipedias significantly. The next one is the German Wikipedia. And like that's right behind, but all the Western Wikipedias are far more robust. Some Wikipedias only have a thousand articles or so. And uh, this really needs to change. So Wikipedia, uh, to give you kind of like a basic overview, it has uh, five pillars. Uh, it's a, it, and these are, they're very basic. It says Wikipedia is an online encyclopedia, has a neutral point of view, it's free content. Wikipedians should interact in a respectful and civil manner and that it does not have firm rules, okay? So these, these pillars are what the only things that are actually kind of firm to Wikipedia, but as anyone who is familiar with the way in which kind of, you know, language functions, it's, these are very kind of mushy kind of uh, uh, things to have as pillars. Um, the biggest thing about, that you need to understand about uh, Wikipedia as an online encyclopedia is not only uh, can, and we can come back again to like, what is an encyclopedia? Cause that has a, a very much a kind of Western tradition. Of, uh, but Wikipedia is the only encyclopedia that most people know these days, right? If you ask kids, what is an encyclopedia? If you ask anyone probably under 20, what is encyclopedia? They'd be like, you, like Wikipedia. Most of them are only gonna know Britannica existed. Uh, Almost none of them would ever have had it on their shelves unless their grandma gave them a copy. Uh, it's, it's, it is the encyclopedia. And despite, you know, now it's 21 years old, despite it having a, a little bit of a rough start, it is now, uh, there are over a dozen uh, and probably more being published uh, academic articles that compare uh, it to uh, major uh, encyclopedic uh, publications, and it is just as accurate in most of the major areas, if not more. Uh, so it, this isn't a point of accuracy. This is a point of like, where do people know where to get knowledge? Where do they know what encyclopedia is? Now with that, and this is going to come back multiple times, you have to remember Wikipedia is an encyclopedia, which means it is a tertiary source, which means it only can include information from secondary sources it cannot be publishing new information, right? This is not a, it's not journalism, right? This is not the New York Times. This is something that covers stuff that's already been published. This is why it's the sum of not all human knowledge, not the creation of human knowledge, right? So you immediately start to see that when they say the term knowledge, it means written down, which obviously 
is an issue when it comes to what knowledge means writ large, because if it's not within a written tradition, it doesn't count for Wikipedia because of other things around verifiability and reliability. And we can come back to that later. So uh, the second is that uh, Wikipedia is a neutral point of view. Now, what they want it to be is neutrality as this kind of language of representation of trying to express the information in the most basic neutral way possible. Uh, this, this means not only that it shouldn't be filled with a bunch of, uh, you know, sales words or trying to convince people there's no arguments other than explaining what an argument is in somewhere else, but it's trying to represent things in the most neutral uh, language possible, but also the representation here means that when it's representing information, it should represent it neutrally as in actually balanced. And I don't mean like the Fox News idea of fair and balanced. I mean, actually balanced to what is actually published, which means if you have an article on climate change and 99% of uh, published uh, articles on climate change or about how it is, uh, you know, made by humans and, and pushed forward by humans, and you have 1% that is not, that means 99% of that article needs to include that, and you only have 1% of the Wikipedia article that can mention the, uh, the other part, right, the, the other side. So fair and balanced does not mean we both get equal sides. It means representation of what is out there equally, which obviously is great for things like climate change, but can also be problematic when it comes to representing, uh, you know, underrepresented uh, cultures and opinions, right? So this is this kind of tension where you don't want to get into this kind of like crackpot theory stuff, but you also want to make sure that you, you know, are representative of other voices, right? So there's always this kind of tension that's going on in Wikipedia. So Wikipedia's free content is, uh, is more than just free. This is not just free beer. It means uh, free uh, freedom. Uh, it means that you can use it in different ways. It means it has a specific licenses that tell you how you can use it. It means you can go and edit it. You can participate it. Now, just because it's not uh, simple to edit doesn't mean you can't edit, but this is, we'll also come back to that. But you have to remember that this idea of openness here is an ethic and an ideology around this kind of that that I would say is one of the only this the last remaining kind of like good things that uh, that we can still hold on to from this kind of like techno utopianism that came out or that that very much birthed Wikipedia is this idea that like remaining open means that we can still that we can continue to share right and that. It is, it is absolutely fundamental to it. It is within the fabric of what Wikipedia is and uh, has very much to do with this kind of the, of the idea of access and, and continues to fight for uh, the idea of equity, not equality of it, right? But like people need to be able to access things in different ways and we need to be able to uh, uh, provide that equitable uh, space to be able to uh, participate and access information. Um, the thing about Wikipedia is uh, being civil is, I mean, obviously it just means don't be a jerk to each other, uh, but it really, it, it, you have to understand that Wikipedia is not a tech, a lot of students when they, they're like, oh, Wikipedia, and they're like, oh, it's, you know, an app or whatever, and they, they don't recognize that Wikipedia is a community, it's a community that is, uh, it's an assemblage of, of machinic parts, right? It's assemblage, there are bots, there are software uh, pieces that help to kind of let it function. There are all sorts of different parts, but it is at its very core, a community of people. And it's a community of people with a very uh, different and very weird, you know, compared to most communities, uh, uh, you know, drive. Their goal is to provide the free, uh, the access to the, the sum of all human knowledge for free to everyone in their own language. That is, that's a that's a lofty goal, uh, but it is a community that is 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 uh, uh, built around these pillars. Uh, so you have to remember, it is people, and people are weird, and they are different, especially people, especially people who want to do that for a hobby on their free time are definitely weird. 
the type of weird I like, but like weird nonetheless. Uh, so you have to understand that this is this is going to be a complex community, right? And then the last thing is it, they say that Wikipedia doesn't have firm rules, but there are hundreds uh, of uh, policies and um, and uh, uh, tons of documents and guidelines. And there is a lot of hierarchy that is built into Wikipedia, not just uh, specifically about like the way in which uh, users can have certain levels of access, depending on how long they've been participating or how much they participated, but also in the way in which there's a lot of hierarchy with what you know and how you implement it and really how much time you have for that. And we're going to get back to that as well. Uh, in this very short time that I'm going to be talking about this. So hopefully lots of questions and discussions. So uh, really the, the biggest concerns in this book uh, and the biggest concerns that I have are really, and they always have been around equity and access. Like most of my scholarship uh, has been around accessing information, is about the spread of knowledge, is about, uh, about how people can access information, how people, uh, it, how we can create equitable systems, right? Not everyone has access, but how do you, you know, for example, uh, if you have, a, you know, a, a sidewalk, right, you know, you need to have curb cuts so that uh, people with mobility uh, issues can navigate those spaces. It's the same when it comes to internet spaces, right? So creating equitable spaces where people can participate in access is really important. Uh, this is why I, I often try to tell people you need to think about the internet more like architecture and how people move in it and participate, rather than the way in which we've kind of thought that like, oh, it's just it's free, everyone can do it, it's just fine. And it's not that way at all, because we're just not thinking about like, the, the, the same kind of things that a lot of the people who have been in disability studies have been thinking about this for a long time, we need to start thinking about that in, um, in uh, online communities. Um, so the big thing uh, you also need to remember is that when we talk about inclusive practices, like what defining what something is, we're always talking about exclusion, right? When there is an inclusion, there's always exclusion. And like, this is something that, uh, you know, Briankel and I would probably talk about all the time. This is, this is something that, uh, very much uh, uh, hints of that when he said the background that I have in like continental theory. And, uh, but like, you have to remember that communities are going and systems are defining themselves through exclusion. One of the ways in which uh, uh, Wikipedia does this is by saying basically not everything is encyclopedic, right? So the question on the other side is, you know, what is encyclopedic, if not everything is, what is the sum of all human knowledge when it comes to that encyclopedic? And then part of that has to do with, uh, you know, what people think um, can be included. And, and that has to do with a lot of different policies. One of the most important ones is about notability, which has been constantly utilized in ways to exclude uh, specifically uh, women and people of color, uh, scientists uh, in, in particular. There have been quite a few articles, uh, specifically Donna Strickland, who was the uh, first Nobel laureate uh, since Madame Curie in physics. Uh, for like 75 years or something like that. Uh, she didn't have a Wikipedia article until like the day she got, uh, she got the nomination. And she's got a ton of publications, all these other things. But because uh, someone had turned that down, said she wasn't notable enough because there weren't enough articles about her. Now, maybe that was true, but we also have to think about these systemic biases. Now, if she didn't have enough articles written about her in the New York Times or whatnot, but her colleagues did, that were men, we and it, who all have the same types of publications, and everything else. We have to think about this bias of who's reporting and how that trickles into Wikipedia, right? So, tertiary representation will always suffer from these biases, right? And so, although you you know people like to cast the blame on Wikipedia, I like to think about Wikipedia as being a light that can shine back on those who are creating those secondary sources. Right. And say, you know why Wikipedia doesn't have as much? Because we've tried to go out and cover these people and there's no coverage of them. OK, and that helps us to kind of like look back at ourselves and say, what is the work that we need to do to create better uh, equity in representation? Right. What is an equitable? And, and then Wikipedia itself can also say, 
What are the works that we can do? Do we need to then say, hey, look, we recognize this person wasn't covered as much because they're a woman, but we're evaluating this and saying this person is very notable, right? So there are ways in which we can start to uh, uh, enact these things. And then, of course, this bias is amplified by human users. There are plenty of examples of where uh, Wikipedians have utilized their, the rules to be exclusionary, where whether they knew it or not, they were judging that more harshly because it wasn't, you know, a, a, a white guy or whatever, uh, you know. So you have to understand that the people who then nominate an article for deletion or, uh, you know, try to get people to vote on it, many articles never get tagged like that. You have to actually know the rules to be able to then uh, exclude things. And the real issue here is that everyone has an opinion about how what equals an encyclopedia and what needs to be included. But what it comes down to is that a lot of people use what has been termed uh, in a few publications called power plays. Uh, and what that really is, is a few people who really know the rules really, really well want to argue and use and, and, and utilize those rules in an inequitable and unjust way to enforce those rules, right? So it's kind of like uh, if, uh, you know, we talk about this in, in Chicago all the time about, uh, about policing, you know, same laws for everybody, but guess what? They're policing heavier in areas that are black and brown and then specifically arresting people at higher rates for things that, guess what? The white communities are not getting policed at, they're not getting arrested at. <clears throat> So when we come to this, we're saying <clears throat> a, a system that we say is somewhat just, you know, that has these rules, the rules are not being applied equitably, right? They're being applied specifically in a biased manner. Why? Because people are biased. So uh, back to uh, how I got kind of started with this and, uh, and <clears throat> What I want to really kind of speak to here, uh, uh, and, I'll, and I'll sum up with a, a, a few nice words, I swear, um, is that teaching with Wikipedia has been one of the greatest experiences uh, of, of my teaching career uh, so far. And the reason why is because I found it to, to be incredibly useful for a lot of different things. I have a couple of uh, new papers out uh, even since this, uh, uh, a recent one in Social Media and Society. Um, where we specifically look at the um, Association of College and Research Libraries uh, Framework for Information Literacy. And we evaluate teaching with Wikipedia along these frameworks and really try to understand like, not only how can we better implement like information literacy uh, training, but also uh, enact uh, 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 social justice techniques, right? Like, and, and practices of justice, not in, in multiple ways. And, so when I talk about experiential epistemology here, you know, it sounds a little funky, but really means like, is that through learning Wikipedia, they are learning how knowledge functions, how information functions, how it comes into the world, how it's created, how it can be utilized, right? And those are the basic tenets of information literacy that are so valuable right now. And, and the reason why this is so important for you to think about at, at all of you who are, are teaching, who are who want to be teaching, who are going to be teaching, who are, 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 are think about teaching and talk to other teachers, is that it is the largest open educational resource in the world. Even if people think they're not supposed to be using it, they are. Everyone goes to Wikipedia. It has over 18 billion page views a month. And this is an absolutely incredible uh impact towards equity in, uh, in, in education. People across the globe, if they have access, and I, I for example, I've, I've, uh, I know, uh, just as a slight aside, I know of a, a program that was in Iraq, uh, actually, that was anyone with a cell phone that was accessing Wikipedia, the data wouldn't count towards it. So they could access Wikipedia 
even though their data cost a bunch of money or whatever, the, anytime they access Wikipedia, it was free. It was a, it was a program that Wikimedia Foundation kind of campaigned for with a, a, with a cell phone provider. So the, these people always have Wikipedia in their pockets. People have Wikipedia in their pockets, even if they don't have access to education, right? So there is a huge amount of potential for people to have access to information in ways that they never did, right? Imagine, uh, you know, all sorts of communities that have, you know, banned lots of books and lots of thinking and lots of ways. Wikipedia has far better neutral representation of facts, of things that, or, and they don't even use the word facts. What they use is the term reliable information, right? It's from a reliable source and it can be verified, which means it's from somewhere else that we can point to, right? So it kind of sidesteps the idea of facts and the idea of truth. Um, but remember that this is, a, this is, it can be utilized for you know, amazing ways, and it already stands as uh, something that everyone who has who can get access to the internet, they have that for free. Um, and what we can learn from Wikipedia is is that it utilize despite it being this kind of like crazy wild west where you know like hey look again it's twenty one years old now it's like basically geriatric uh, for the internet. Uh, it utilizes these very traditional structures of verifying information, of, uh, of looking for enough information to be notable, of uh, making sure that there are reliable sources that can be pointed to. A lot of these are very traditional epistemological uh, structures like of like how we function in the, in the academy. You know, when I say something, I need to back it up. I'm, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants and all Wikipedia is, is really just a conglomeration of giants, right? So there's, at least that's how it should be, you know, it doesn't always function that way, but most of the time. So when you, but the, but, but on top of that, when you see the, the space of Wikipedia, you then also see how it's being cited. You see that there are references at the end. You understand the language of neutrality as you're reading it, because you recognize how things are sold to you and you recognize that Wikipedia is not selling it to you. I always tell people, if you wanna know what a nonprofit organization does, don't go to their website, go to Wikipedia because you will go through a bunch of like puppies and kittens and you're like, I have no idea what's going on here. They're just, they're just trying to get me to be a donor or something here. But like, if you actually go, they'll be like, they do this. This is, they are here. This is how much money they have. This is this, this, this. And I'm like, this, that's all I needed. That's what I wanted to know. So. Participating and, and starting to experience Wikipedia, you're starting to understand and experience those, like, those structures of knowledge. And then the next thing is that when you teach with it, you are forcing those who are uh, learning with it to experience these processes, experience these information literacy uh, processes understanding bias because they will be like, I'm interested in this topic and they will find there is not that topic. Right? Maybe it's not on Wikipedia. Maybe it's not even available for them to find secondary sources about. So people can start to experience this inequity uh, and see this, see how represent what knowledge representation looks like for the space that should be covering the sum of all human knowledge. And the other, the big thing, and and at uh, and at UIC, uh, we we have a lot of first generation students and uh, you know, our students are the students of Chicago. We are, we are uh, both a, you know, a Carnegie research one, as well as we are a, we are right in the center of Chicago and our students are often Pell Grant eligible. We are trying to, we have students who are, who are mostly working full-time, you know, or at least part-time. I don't have a single student who doesn't have a job. Uh, and, so they need a little bit of inspiration, right? Because papers that go into the trash uh, don't often inspire, inspire people who are like literally trying to like pay rent, right? They have other priorities that come beforehand. And, and you know, I gotta be honest, uh, the, the internet and the whole world like is constantly talking about like how everything is terrible and, and horrible and lots of things are a mess and, you know, people want to make a difference. And they, a lot of people who are stuck in these classes, they're like, what is this actually doing? Why I want to get out there and, and, and help. I want to, I want to make things better. And these little things, 
right? Knowing that I can help represent a person who wasn't represented, I can help improve that article that people are reading. That's something that actually is a, like a true public project that people can really invest in. And, uh, and, and my students have always put 110% uh, into these projects, which is why I actually scale them back significantly because I, they actually want to edit. They want to edit, edit again and again and again, because they know this is going to be read by people. And that is not only inspiring, but it teaches them so much more than just putting a bunch of words on the page and giving them to me and then saying goodbye. So, um, you know, so that's some really nice stuff. Uh, but that being said, you know, Wikipedia is, has lots of issues, right? Um, I love it, but it has lots of issues. But, you know, I think that, I think that if you just love something and won't critique it, I don't know if you really love it. Um, you know, as I say, I, one of the reasons I, I, I miss Massachusetts is that, uh, uh, you know, my, my good friends will tell me when I'm, when I'm totally full of it, right? My good friends will tell me when I'm wrong and they love me. But they'll be like, Zach, I love you, but you're full of it. And so that's what a good friend does. And that's what real care and love is about. And I love Wikipedia, but it is problematic many times. Uh, their idea uh, of free and some of all human knowledge is very much techno-utopianism of this idea of equality. It does not understand uh, equity. Just because you can open the door does not mean you're inviting everyone in. Okay. And even if you've invited people into the party and then no one wants to talk to that person, not great. And if you invite, and imagine if you get invited in and uh, you have mobility issues and there's a bunch of stairs. And then once you get in, it's a bunch of people who uh, uh, all want to speak in a bunch of like, you know, uh, uh, jargony language and none of them look like you and none of them want to help you like learn how to participate in their community. It's not uh, it's not an easy community to get involved in. It can be hostile at times, as much of the internet can be. Um, and one of the big things that I've always pointed out, uh, you know, on a basic tenant, one of the, the earliest articles on Wikipedia was this idea of be bold. Because they're like, you know, you have to be bold to make that edit. You have to be bold to write the art, you know, be bold and make that change. And really that is, that assumes an orientation, right? that not everyone has. And I'm not saying that you don't eventually have to be bold, but like if your experience in your life is that when you've been bold, you've been shot down over and over and over again, that's not the way that you want to be invited in, right? So you need to, you, that's where we need to think about how can we create more equitable systems to invite a, uh, a more uh, representative group uh, uh, of, of Wikipedians in, because as far as we know, and it's hard to, you know, understand uh, who participates with stuff on the internet, but it's about 10% are women of Wikipedians who edit, about 10%. And almost all of them, almost all of that 90% uh, of men are uh, Western, English speaking, some college, no kids, and often white. So it's a very small you know, thing. And, and these guys are great. I know a lot of them and they write about amazing stuff. But like, look, I got thrown, uh, you know, Hardy Boys, uh, you know, uh, books when I was a kid. I did not get thrown a bunch of Jane Austen. So that wasn't my experience until later. So like, you can only write about what you know. This isn't about like, oh, they're bad because they're this. It's like, because they're volunteering their time. It's saying they don't have the same experience as all these other people, so they won't write about all the things that they don't know. And that's why we need to invite more people in. And that's how we need to think about how do we invite more people in in a more just and equitable manner. So uh, really, and, and this is where I'm going to be closing out here, uh, it's clear that we need a new type of boldness, one that is not an assumption of agency, but is an active construction and inclusion. And that's what I that's that's what I want you to think about here is like how do we invite people in to something that we don't assume their their specific agency in that specific area, but instead we are actively constructing inclusion, and and really we can make it happen because again this is my happy ending. Um, Wikipedia's greatest potential is change. It, it is community driven. It has a really good. Uh, 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 bunch of people they want to be better most of them do and they want that so 
this is a really cool community that is, is and, and you know, there, there's this great article out there. You can you can look it up. It's called Wikipedia is the last best place on the internet. It, it convinced me. It, I mean, I was already convinced, but it's the only place left that isn't trying to sell you stuff constantly and trying to like mine your data and everything else. It really does just want to be the best. It just doesn't know how to yet. And then I think we can all help. So thank you. That's one. That's wonderful. Uh, hi, Zach. Yeah, to Zach, I say it's a wonderful presentation, informative, reflexive, and uh, critical. As uh, is in keeping with uh, uh, you as a, a researcher. Now, uh, let's open for a discussion. You know, Q and A. You know, if you have anybody who has a question, uh, just raise uh, your hand. And I think uh, Martha will be able to. Uh, you know, administer and the sequence of questions. Anybody? I guess that I had a question actually, but um, Caroline, can you please go ahead first? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Zach, for a, a fascinating talk. Um, something that really came to mind during your talk was, um, well, there were a couple of things that I wanted to touch on regarding to representation, but I'm just going to stick with one for right now. So I was thinking about uh, um, the scholar Sarah Ahmed and how she talks about the politics of citation. And so there were a couple of things that came up for me around kind of representation. So I'm, I'm going to ask you two questions and uh, um, just see where it goes. So uh, one of them was um, around that question of politics of citation, right? So um, kind of, I'm kind of curious about how people who are more oriented towards like uh, um, addressing equity and uh, representation issues on Wikipedia think about not just kind of the representation of who's written about, but um, whose writings are used to inform um, what's represented in Wikipedia. Um, and then the other question I wanted to ask was kind of related to something that you touched on earlier, which was the importance of open access resources. And I wanted to ask for your thoughts about how, um, like whether or how Wikipedia functions to kind of get around some of the challenges of like paywalls to scholarly information, right? So thinking about like, Wikipedia is a potential um, route for kind of releasing some of that information if it's behind a paywall. So again, thank you for your talk. Thank you, Caroline. It's so nice to see your face. Um, this just, I, I, I just, especially after the pandemic, like seeing a lot of these people, like just uh, that I that I care about and and inform the the type of scholar that I want to be is just wonderful. Uh, I I couldn't have paid you to give me better questions. Um, so the uh, the first one is is interesting because the way in which i mean again like this is anybody can edit wikipedia if they know if they know how they do all the training they're part of all the different steps that you have to go through um so what this comes down to neutrality right and um and and what i was saying earlier about how what we should be doing is including all of those right and uh and there is who's writing about what and then and there's just a lot of a lot of organizational politics about like how do you then reorganize how do you have a new section what do you put in that new section um but you know who's getting included in wikipedia should be anything that's being written about that um and and then uh over time it should i mean the 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 idea here, and I guess I know this is kind of like this kind of techno utopian ideal is that essentially, supposedly, the good stuff will continue to rise out and then you will continue to delete the stuff that is not well backed up the stuff that is uh, the stuff that is and then and rewrite uh, the stuff that is maybe problematic in ways that can be representative of this stuff what has been said right there's a lot of articles in Wikipedia that have like controversy areas right. Um, and there, you relegate that stuff to the controversy and like, oh, this has been published about this, this, and this, and this, but you don't, you try to not represent it, that information in a way that says anything other than this is a thing that was said, right? Um, I always say like, you know, don't you dare ever cite Joe Rogan as something for that, unless it's specifically on the Joe Rogan article to say what Joe Rogan said, right? Because that's a fact that Joe Rogan said that other than that, no. 
Um, and then um, the second, uh, sorry, I got carried away. What was the, briefly the second one again? Um, briefly, just the kind of rule of open access resources okay. like Wikipedia and trying to kind of route around some of the um, impediments to access that are involved in scholarly publishing. So so Wikipedia has like an entire tool for that. And there's like a game, it's called, uh, there's a citation hunt game where like you can then uh, find open, open access versions of these articles. So Wikipedia is this great tool for a lot of things that are like stuff is hidden uh, because people don't want paywalls so that you can check it. And so what people will do is they'll find stuff that's been tagged by bots, right? To say, this is behind a paywall and what they'll say, and, and so there's an entire list of ones saying, can you go find this article and link it so we can get around the paywall? And there are plenty of people, and, and, and the thing is most publishers, especially academic publishers, will allow you to house your stuff in a personal, you know, or an, an academic repository, right? As Marilyn is, is uh, waving around there. And so you can then go find that and then link it to uh, that academic repository instead of the journal itself. So at, a Wikipedia can get around paywalls in ways that is not, they're not really getting around it, but they, because Wikipedia wants to, as a, as a community, wants to be able to represent that information and have access so that you can check that, right? You should be able to verify it, which is why, again, this is a why I say like the students learn uh, information literacies and why they trust Wikipedia is they go, oh, I not only am uh, able to verify it, but I've learned how to verify it. And I trust that I can verify this if I have any doubts. Okay, please Marilyn, go ahead. Uh, I can wait. <laughs> oh, you are mute, you're still mute. Sorry, I can't do two things at once, like lower my hand in, unmute. <laughs> So I just wanted to add to what Zach was just talking about, and Caroline, there's a lot to unpack in what you asked. Um, I did put a little bit about open educational resources and what the libraries are doing into the chat, um, but there's a lot about open scholarship that we're engaged in. I see my colleague Christine Turner on the call, and I don't want to spend a lot of time um, right now, working, uh, talking through all of that, but we'd love to engage you in the conversation going forward. Um, uh, with institutional repositories, just a quick reminder, we have as, a, as an institution uh, an open access policy so that we can deposit any of the creative works that you're doing into our repository. Uh, more on that later too. <laughs> and, and, and at UIC, we have the same policy. Yes, and yes. I will say this, uh, you know, one of the, I got into open access stuff from a variety of different ways, but Marilyn was one of the people who helped me understand how to do this in the university and not be scared of it. And I mean, I'm going up for tenure now. And one of the biggest things that I've had to make an argument for, and thankfully it's so much easier now that all these librarians have our back, is that every single thing that I published has been open access. And that's not just like before it used to mean, oh, it wasn't as good. And now I try to explain like for this book, this is published by Rutledge. I had to get grants and research funding to give this as open access. You can download this from Rutledge for free or you can pay $60 for it, okay? Uh, no one I know has bought this book and I don't want them to. Uh, you never hear people say that about, about books. I don't want you to spend $60 on this. I don't think that it's, it's a $60 book. Uh, I don't think anything is a $60 book, I gotta be honest. Um, I, but I want you to read it, which is why I went out, I dug for grants, I applied for grants, I negotiated for an open ed access, I made sure that it was the right type of, uh, you know, uh, open access. And not only did they put it there, but it's also on amazon.com on Kindle for free. You can buy it hardback for 59 bucks, or you can download it onto your Kindle for free. So this is something I'm really proud of, but it's like, one of the things that only the uh, OER people like really, dork, uh, we all geek out about it but it's, it's so important. And it took me a ton of money and a ton of time to be able to do, but it was absolutely worth it so that people could be able to read it. Yeah, so I, I had a question. Um, I haven't read the book and I will download my open access, 
but uh, you know, I just share also uh, an article in preparation for this conversation. I kind of was looking at your recent writing and I found this article uh, very helpful. The one on Wikipedia and open education practices kind of where you present the framework. Um, and I so much appreciate um, your, you know, your perspective from the experiential learning point of view and thinking and focusing on practices. So I really recommend people to take a look to that article in particular. I guess that's something probably in the book is, is uh, explain and analyze. But I, I just wanted to ask a more kind of institutional question, which is certainly um, all the, the your work is, um, have built on you know the work of uh, librarians and people in the open access movement and whatnot. Um, but it, there is so much that can be really informing like media literacy and education. And, and I, I just feel that the conversation is not really fluid, <laughs> you know, between the two fields. And I just wanted to have your piece of, you know, your reflection on that. Uh, I also uh, listening to you, you just remind me that um, we have this tradition in this department. You came from this department, you and Brianco started the journal also 10 years ago, by the way, we will talk with Marilyn because uh, we are thinking about some sort of celebration for the 50th anniversary of the department next fall and you should be part of that. But it's actually that, I mean, what do you think about the conversation that has to happen between, I guess, um, these frameworks that come more from definitely um, information science and library studies and whatnot and the media literacy part? So I, that's a great question. And I think that, uh, I, so this is one of the reasons why I think that it's uh, really important that we all keep talking together. And I also, I really like the ACRL uh, framework over a lot of the other things because it has more to do with like a critical evaluation, right? And skills that one needs to learn for that because media literacy is about that critical evaluation, right? It's about that critical moment. It's not about, can you tell me if this is, APA or MLA, right? Uh, is this, you know, is this citation right? Which is our very, very, these are very, very old school ways of like, oh, can, do you, do you know how to do a citation right? Um, rather than understanding why is it important to cite, right? Why is this important? Why is media literacy important? Um, is very similar in that kind of way in which we kind of like, we try to focus on how can you evaluate this information that's coming through, this media that's coming through, right? Whether, however you want to understand it and then be able to kind of make decisions about what the meanings are. And uh, so being able to kind of pair these kind of uh, these critical, I mean, again, I come from that department. I mean, the department that I was at for my undergrad and, and, and master's is also very much like critical cultural studies. Like this is where we, this is, to me, this is the foundation of how we need to be approaching the world is this kind of way in which we have better ways of asking questions about the things that we're experiencing. So I think that we need to have better conversations because, uh, because often this media literacy and information literacy, like a lot of times it's doing, we're, we're talking about the exact same thing, right? We're talking about critically evaluating the world around us. And, and one of the things that I pointed out in, um, in that, uh, in, in a recent article that I was uh, uh, writing, it's going to be coming out on fast capitalism, I think, in, uh, uh, later in the year, is about how uh, as the as the internet kept kind of like taking over the world, <laughs> right, throughout the last kind of uh, uh, couple decades, we've the idea of what media is has just radically shifted and is constantly shifting. So when we think like what is media education, what is media literacy, what is information even, it's we've had so much shift that all of these ideas are kind of like constantly overlapping. So there's not any hard and fast rules anymore. What there are, are better ways of asking questions, right? And there's a lot of different things that we can't just teach people like this because guess what? the tricksters will be one step ahead of us. As soon as we have a way to, so what we need is deeper learning about, uh, critical learning about how we can evaluate information in a variety of ways that it comes through in a variety of mediums. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and, uh, Emily, please. We definitely have. 
Yeah, I um, I just wanted to say thank you actually to Zach. I thought it was such a great talk, and um, uh, it's really more just a couple of comments about um, how I can see. Um, well, I, I'm teaching media and globalization like this week in my big lecture class, so now I have a great um, couple of talking points about Wikipedia um, for my lecture tomorrow that completely fit with the uh, you know what we're going to talk about. So thank you for that. But also, I just wanted to mention, you know, we're actually in the um, we're talking right now about um, creating a new requirement for our undergrads at the 200 level called ways of knowing, which is sort of research methods, but really like broader than that. It's about how do we construct knowledge. And, and I was just like, we have to have a week on Wikipedia at least, you know, and we have to have an assignment and we got to pick that. We can actually run the class on Wikipedia. <laughs> it could be the whole, yeah, it could be the, the focus of the entire class almost. So um, I love how it's like I a mean, play of a, the, the ways of seeing, a, right? Ways of knowing versus ways of seeing, right? Yeah, I totally, yeah. <laughs> so I just think, yeah, you're just giving me so many ideas and it's very inspirational. And and um, and also, I don't know if you have any broader comments, because I know we have, um, you know, grad students on the call about, about how you've had your research and teaching speak to each other. Um, like the synergies you've had there, you know, how you've navigated that, um, you know, maybe, it, you know, maybe what you work on really lends itself to that more than what everybody works on. But I just think it's really, um, I can't think of too many other scholars who, you know, have that, have such a synergy. And I just, I think it'd be great if you have any other comments or advice about that for all of us. Yeah, uh, I, I thank you. I really, you know, I really appreciate being seen. Um, like th it's something that I dedicated my life to. Uh, it's something that uh, it really means a lot to me. Um, I just I've been writing up my you know my my uh, tenure documents and it's like my all my statements are like this is three legs of the same stool for me. Um, my service has to do with that you know the open education um, uh, the open education work the the open uh, educational practices work that I've done with Wikipedia. I, uh, I run workshops in in areas uh, all over to uh, to teach people how to uh, like go out and 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 edit Wikipedia to go uh, to uh, create better representation. Uh, but really, I mean, for me, I found that if you find something that you're really passionate about, uh, you will work forever, every single day, 24 hours a day of your life. Um, <laughs> It's not working, not working at all. You will work forever. But um, I found that it's worked incredibly well for me because uh, especially right now, I think that uh, we all know that uh, there's a lot of systemic inequity, right? And I think that a lot of us are really concerned about that, right? Um, and so if you can find these small ways to try to make a difference, because like, let's be honest, like there's, it's systemic issues are systemic because there's, they're complicated. There's so many different pieces, but if you can make your headway into that, pull that into your teaching because your students are going to appreciate it. Your students are going to feel that passion and they're going to respond, right? And uh, the more that you, and, and you will fail, right, at times. I have failed miserably with Wikipedia before. I have failed miserably many times in, in, in scholarship and, and uh, teaching and service. Like, and, but if you keep coming back and trying to learn and being open to that and understanding that, um, you know, you have to keep trying to new things and trying to approach things from new ways, um, you'll find that your passions can inform all of it and and can link together and you know i don't always teach with wikipedia uh but you know it's never not also helped me understand things um when i teach other uh topics i take the learnings that i have from this about representation about um uh, about understanding how people are coming from different perspectives uh over the pandemic one of my biggest, uh, you know, uh, people have been talking about for a long time, you know, uh, how students, they went back to their homes and they didn't have the access to the internet they, they usually did. They didn't have the computers that they usually did. And thinking about not just like, how do you organize your class so that people can turn the stuff in, but thinking about like, how can you create uh, systems where students feel okay to talk to you to say, I really need some extra time. I've got 
I, it's, it's, it's really hard out there right now. And, you know, trying to cut the fluff out, trying to cut the busy work out, have them see, have them feel being seen um, is, is, it is wonderful. Um, and, and not only are you going to get better work because they're going to care because they know you care, um, but, but they're going to be inspired in other classes. They're not going to feel frustrated. And I say that all the time. I said, like, one of the biggest things that I've learned about Wikipedia is that it can be very, very frustrating to learn how to, uh, to, to edit. If you don't have the right teacher, if you don't have people who are dedicated there to help you along, and it's the same thing, honestly, in any teaching environment. Students are constantly frustrated, and it is the biggest letdown for them, especially for first generation students, especially for those who really, really need to like excel. And they don't have that support group. They don't have uh, a, an identity that is saying, I am a college student. They're like, I don't belong here. So help them feel like they belong. And honestly, if you just, you can bring that into anything. You can bring that into your whole life. And if you live like that, the world is going to be a better place. Thank you. That's very inspiring. We do have two people with questions. I just want to acknowledge that. Can we hear from both of you? So because we are actually a little over the hour, but please, uh, we want to hear from you. Yes, please. Uh, Christine and then Jake. Uh -huh. Thanks. Um, hi, Zach. I'm Christine Turner, and I'm a uh, scholarly communication librarian, came into the department uh, after you left UMass. Uh, love so many things that you have to say and um, what you are doing. I am uh, exploring and thinking a lot about the uh, the paradoxes in uh, in the wiki communities in terms of, um, or I should say, use the term and, and you speak of it as a community. And as such, there's inclusion and there's exclusion. Mm -hmm. And um, and even the uh, tension as you spoke about being bold, but that then includes people who are by nature bold and excludes those who aren't. Um, and you also spoke about hierarchies and um, the barriers that those can uh, put forward to people and, um, and the principle of being uh, civil. Um, and yet there's, I know there's competition uh, among those in the Wiki community so I'm, I'm really, I'm thinking about so many of these things and, and um, you know, nurturing and loving critically and thinking <laughs> about um, uh, the book Research as Ceremony by Sean Wilson. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but um, about, um, about building community and, um, and giving back and mutuality. In, in indigenous culture specifically uh, through research. Your final challenge to us um, about making, making a more inclusive Wicca, Wikimedia, Wikipedia community, um, I imagine in your writings you're exploring that, but I, I guess I just wanna hear more thoughts about that. And, and I'm particularly interested in the tensions um, and the paradoxes of hierarchy and community and inclusion and exclusion. Uh, I mean, yes. I could go on for, forever. So, you know, oh, sorry, can I, can I say, because we're a little over there with yeah. some people. So I just want to hear from Jake and now then we can okay. uh, yeah. prop up. I was going to say, I, I could speak briefly, but let's hear from Jake and I'll try to address everybody at the same time. Thank you. Hi everyone. Hi, Professor McDowell. Uh, my name is Jake. I um I teach business communication at the business school, and I also just want to say that um, I found out about this lecture from just walking by a bulletin board that someone stapled a notice to. So well, thank cool. you, to, thank you to everyone who did that. That stuff actually works. Um, I <laughs> teach a little bit of information literacy. I'm uh, I talk to my students about using Wikipedia. I uh, in, you know, as I'm sure many of us do, I encourage them to use it as a as a repository to other 
credible sources. And I'm fascinated by what you described, which is really all new to me of teaching with it and teaching students. And it sounds like what you're doing is you are modeling good, that you're modeling best practice of how to edit Wikipedia articles and create Wikipedia articles. And I'm just wondering in a, in a very short, pithy way, if you could summarize the success you've had with that, how many of these, you know, what percentage of these edits uh, or creations survive the, survive whatever sort of oversight does exist with Wikipedia. Um, I think it's just a fascinating assignment and I'm interested in how it goes in the classroom. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, so let me, and I also have a nice question here from the chat. I'll try to uh, approach everything uh, uh, briefly. To start with, because this is the, the kind of the easiest way to uh, uh, start, my students have had incredible success. Um, I think almost all of the articles are still up. Uh, and the class that I usually teach with Wikipedia now is I teach a public relations class where I'm basically teaching them to like, you know, be critical of propaganda and public relations. And what they do is they write a Wikipedia article about a nonprofit uh, that they're really interested in, mostly in Chicago. We've gotten started to get to, like, we've had so many years of it now that like, you know, they're, we're running out of nonprofits. But uh, I mean, they're, they've had a lot of success. And the reason why is because of a lot of this uh, good, I mean, because I know what I'm doing, but also because of the efforts of the Wiki, Wiki Education Foundation. Um, to Oliver uh, uh, in the chat, there. It, so the interface is can be confusing, but uh, the there are a bunch of trainings, right? And they have done some revisions to this uh, to this as well, uh, and there are proposals too. There's a you know, uh, and then kind of uh, as a transition over to Christine's question, this is a complicated community, and I think one of the things that uh, I think and, and you you mentioned uh, kind of like indigenous knowledge and stuff. And, and it reminded me of uh, restorative justice circles. Uh, and um, if you don't know what restorative justice is, it's this practice where, um, um, it's this practice where uh, instead of carceral types of uh, systems is they bring uh, people who have offended, you know, the community through, you know, unjust practices, through violence often uh, and otherwise to kind of look into healing uh, uh, these kind of binds. And a lot of this has to do with kind of the ways in which uh, indigenous communities, as well as especially black communities, uh, men have been heavily policed um, and <clears throat> are incarcerated, which breaks, you know, uh, uh, families for, you know, decades. So the practice of saying people aren't perfect uh, but we need to find ways for them to be able to love again and to be loved. And is, uh, it, I, I like to also refer to it like as the new, the Ted Lasso effect now, when we, uh, rather than all these kind of like, oh, these people are terrible. Like, how about we just start approaching things with love, but also realize that people are flawed. Uh, but if we keep approaching things with love um, and, you know, also learn good boundaries, which is what Wikipedia tries to do, says, hey, um, they, they, uh, we have this practice called, you know, good faith and says we should assume good faith. Now, assuming good faith works fine sometimes, but if you've never been in a space where you can, where people assume good faith of you, you know that your being can create a space of people have bad faith around you. So we need to have better practices around this idea of like inclusion and also boundaries where we can say, no, this was not a good way to act. You know, if you would like to be part of this community, this is how we need to act. So <clears throat> there is uh, the last uh, uh, chapter in the book called The Reality That Shapes Wikipedia is a little bit more like that. It's about that. It's about changes that the foundation are doing right now and some of the um, uh, groups out there, such as uh, 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 I see uh, Mackenzie is in the room. Um, <clears throat> a mutual friend of ours runs an organization called Black Lunch Table, which is fantastic. Uh, these groups uh, are helping to lead the conversation that say, how do we have better conversations and better communities? How can we be better inclusive? How can we recognize that this is messy? 
And we cannot expect perfection from everybody, but we're going to move forward in this messy, weird, wacky way that is in, for lack of a better word, is human. Thank we're way you. over time now. <laughs> yeah, we are. But, uh, you know, it, it has been a really nice conversation and uh, one that definitely is opening. Um, it just demonstrated we have to keep going, you know, and keep uh, talking about these issues and create a space for these. And definitely we will do Marilyn. <laughs> uh, we, as I said, I think that um for the fall we we should engage some of these conversations as well in the framework of uh, you know we'll be celebrating the 50th anniversary of the department <laughs> i'm so happy thank you yes. so much for having me this has been really wonderful no no and you have no. correct uh you have just kind of a spark ideas here and let let us like oh well we want more so we'll bring you back so I, I love it i love it <laughs> Uh, UMass will all be always be my home for me, so I, I miss you all. And thank you all. I mean, like uh, um, for your engagement and interest, and it's, now we know each other online. <laughs> <laughs> and please get in contact if you need anything. I can always provide more links. Um, uh, thank you all so much for coming. Yeah, we'll be in touch. Thanks for all again. Bye bye. Good. Thanks, Zach. Thank you, Brinkle. All right. Of course, stay in touch. I will. All right, I know you can go. <clears throat> Thanks, Martha. It was awesome. I think it was a very good conversation. Oh, thank you very much. Well. Yeah, yeah, it's a good, good conversation. All right. But thank you, Jake. <laughs>